been with this for a couple of years now, um, and this year I've sort of launched myself into it probably, um, which has disturbed one or two people, particularly the board of trustees at our school, because boards being boards, they like things that have guaranteed success in the past. Um, this is new, and then just a little bit twitchy as to whether it's going to work or not. Or not or uh, so what is blended learning? Uh, this is a really long definition, but it was the best that I could come up with. Um, for those that are short of sight, we'll read it out. Um, this definition, mixing synchronous and asynchronous instruction, a blended learning approach can combine face-to-face -face facilitation with computer-mediated instruction and or discovery learning opportunities. It also applies IT activities with the assistance of educational technologies using computer, cellular or smartphone, satellite TV, uh, video conferencing and other emerging electronic media. The learners and teachers work together to improve the quality of learning and teaching. The ultimate aim of blended learning being to provide realistic practical opportunities for learners and teachers to make learning independent, useful, sustainable and ever-growing. Uh, and the last little bit I think is, is really cool because we're trying to get people to be lifelong learners and keep working at it. Um, I was talking to a lady yesterday and he asked me to, to tell us a little um, ditty, I suppose, that um, I, I had my teacher appraisal lesson um, on Wednesday. And, uh, the appraiser said to me, right, I'm coming in to see your level two geography class uh, to do the teacher appraisal. Give me a lesson plan of what you're doing. It's fine. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, but, but our appraisal system doesn't measure e-learning. So can you do a traditional lesson, please? Oh. I said, so you want me to stand at the front and be, you know, just, this is what we do, children do this exercise. This yes, because our appraisal system doesn't do it. And I don't understand how you do the e-learning bit either. Are you so, a general appraisal system or a school yeah. appraisal system? So I said, well, I will do what the system requires, but if it's a whole other crap to fuck. And it happens. It turned out the kids were really brilliant and did it. But one of the kids came into class, one of my least able students in that class, she saw me still at the front, because she was a couple minutes late. The other teacher sat there with a notepad, and she came and said, Are you teaching today, mistress? Yeah. Oh, so we're not learning like we like to on the computers. So I said, you're crazy, I'd write that down. Because <laughs> the kids like coming in, getting on the computers and learning that way. In geography, they've gone away from me standing at the front, talking and then listening. They just want a quick, this is the theory bit, do you understand it? And we're straight into learning. That's Nigel, what do, you, what, do you, what do you understand by synchronous and asynchronous? Um, some of it's, um, there is some teaching stuff, and you know, I'll be there helping the kids as they are, and some of it is then learning direct from the computer, waiting from each other. There's a whole heaps of different interactions. Uh, my background, initially I got kind of thrown into VC teaching. Uh, four or five years ago, so we said, oh, we need a VC course, and our school got to buy a teacher, you'll do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, so I got thrown into it, and the first couple of years was, was all right, and I was creating stuff on the, the Wellcome website for the kids to use, but it was just, it was just dumping material there for them to access. Um, and I was using some online stuff on my teaching, and obviously YouTube clips and whatever else. Um, I then started talking to some other teachers, one guy at school particularly, um, the IT teacher who's he's been teaching all over the place and he's really into trying to get the IT out there. Um, and he goes, oh, have you read this article? Have you read that article? Because he just reads his narration reader of material. Um, started looking at it and thought, yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, and then I wanted to know more, so I went to the a grad cert um, Christchurch over two years, which just gave me a whole heap more background about how to design courses and how kids learn. Um, if anybody's thinking about doing anything, it's well worth it. Uh, how do I use it? Oh, sorry, why do I use it? Um, I think it prepares kids better for after school, particularly tertiary education these days. But a lot of the skills they, they're they picking up from what I'm doing um, are just good life skills, decision making, um, learning how to learn, learning how to find things out. Um, and kids these days, as I said yesterday, I think our, our client base is changing. Kids like using the computers, they've grown up using computers. 
they can get stuff done a lot quicker, a lot more effectively on the computer. So use those skills, get a kids to buy in more. Um, so it seems to work for me at the moment. How did I manage to get it going? Um, I carried out a small trial as part of the uh, grad cert, which I think is quite right. Um, I had a petition on the principle of more computers. Um, I put it to Joel's, Biggs, whatever else, um, to get enough computers for it to work. A few teachers um, at the school sort of came on board, and probably the biggest support was Hazel, because she's always just at the end of the wire. The number of Skype conversations we have when you're in meetings, I'm in meetings, and we still manage to do it is just phenomenal. Um, and basically, I just showed the passion for what I want to do uh, by completing that course and doing it at school. So, Can you tell us a bit about the course course, OTL? Um, it's a graduate certificate in online teaching and learning. Oh, okay. And who's it through? I did it through Christchurch. Oh, okay. Is that Derek's course? Is that? Uh, is that UCU Plus? Yeah, um, and it was, I'm trying to think who, oh, Nicky Davis, one of the oh, first yeah. uh, Nicky Davner, um, and a guy who was, I can't remember his name because he was so, <laughs> uh, his, his paper was absolute garbage, he showed no interest in what anybody was doing, there was no feedback until right at the very end of the course, so his assignments, nothing, didn't even get the marks until the <coughs> very end, he was awful, <laughs> but those three guys were really good. You think it helps as a teacher, um, if you're teaching to be an online teacher, to you've been an online student yourself through taking online I think so, yeah. Because you, you pick up good things and you pick up bad things. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I know what's, what didn't work for me. It's not necessarily going to work for the kids, but at least sometimes when they say, but this just isn't working, you can see why they're struggling a bit more. And one of the reasons I did the, that. Um, I was actually getting quite bored of just teaching. I wanted something else to stimulate the brain. Um, and since I've done that and got into this, I've just become so much more enthusiastic again. Which I suppose, you know, when you've been teaching nearly 20 years, you need something that's going to kick some it again. Uh, I've done that one. Um, there's loads of research literature about it. Um, Lots of um, stuff on OTL, but not an awful lot on um, blended teaching and learning in New Zealand. There's lots of stuff from the States, some from the UK. Um, there's been one article came out recently, which I'm going to give you a snippet of, um, which was entitled A Case Study of the First Blended Learning Course in uh, New Zealand. And I thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say anything, but one or two other people said, hang on, you should be coming to us. Nicky Davis wrote something about blended learning within a music context. Yeah, <laughs> they, we had a guy, Michael Barber, out recently from Canada, who did a, a survey around the Vienna schools, etc. And that was funded by us at the ministry, partly as, as well as core education. And Professor Nicky Davis, <coughs> Michael and Derek Winworth presented an online um, thing around that kind of stuff, but yeah, <laughs> just butting in. Coming up, Professor Nicky Davis and that is working really closely with the Educate Group, and I think they're uh, customising their papers to what we do. So I think it's a really valuable course, as, you know, what they're offering if you're interested in that kind of thing. There's another one at Otago um, with uh, Wing, I can't remember the second name, um, well, that might be a second name, I'm not really so. A key point. <coughs> Works through them as well from the Aussie uh, Principal for Otago Network. So they, they, they are probably a couple of the two organisations that we need to look at, please. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and yeah, I've, I've, I said Nikki was one of my tutors from the paper, she's fantastic. Okay. She's so supportive and she knows so much. The article that you're talking about, the first bit of work, blah blah blah, is on computers and computer in schools. Ah. Okay, so we should put up, oh, there is a link to it up there. And if you log on to the registration, you log in and actually join discussion around those articles. There's, there's a posting in the as well. Yeah, you posted yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And Nikki is um, on the editorial board there. And Nikki also writes a column every, every, um, every journal part that comes out, she'll write a column about virtual learning. Yeah, and she's also has involved with the deans. Distance Education Association New Zealand. Uh, they've got some 
some really good stuff on there. Um, just 60 bucks a year to be a member. She's on the governance board of the Ultra Fast Ball Band and Schools project at the ministry as well. Yeah, yeah she is now. I don't know whether it's public knowledge. But... <laughs> 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 I don't even know what to say. Right. Um, <laughs> she's very interested in the school sector, though. She comes from a tertiary background. She's yeah. really interested in what's happening in schools with online learning. So, um, these, this outfit in the UK uh, did a little review about pedagogic approaches to using technologies for learning. Some of the key things that came out of there summarised. Yes. Um, education is becoming increasingly out of step with the way that people use technology. Surprise, surprise. We've still got teachers standing there. Life on the whole thing. Um, we're failing to meet the expectations of learners. Accessibility is rapid feedback and easy usual features people experience every day. You know, if you put something on, on the line online, something comes back pretty quick. Yeah, it's not like sending a, a, a snail mail. You know, you send emails, you get a response pretty quick. Kids like that instant response, they're used to it. And if we're not doing that, we're losing it. Uh, digital natives, digital immigrants, um, which was Prensky's uh, thing. If you've not read any of Prensky's work, around it is well worth having a read. Um, he did talk about digital natives, so our youngsters initially were said to be digital natives and the older members obviously yeah, yeah. Um, would be digital immigrants. Um, that's kind of gone by the by now a little bit. Um, he talks more about digital wisdom now. And um, yeah, White talks about digital residents, digital visitors. So Digital residents are basically people who are there all the time, so we're probably all digital residents because we're always using the stuff. Digital visitors would be people like my wife who just pops them out every now and again, uh, my parents who pop in and out probably once a week. Uh, so they're just uh, visitors now. Natives is quite a good term because it implies that you've grown up there, it's part of your background culture. So you know, as I watch my daughter start at school, it's there, it's, 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 it's constant. Yeah, I, I quite like the term, um, but there's a lot of objections yeah. to it. Yeah, I was going to say, there's been a lot of debate around, around it because of mm -hmm. the implication that, that those people are better users of the digital technologies than so. <coughs> Yeah, so that's the wisdom is the better. And it's the assumption that because you're born of a certain age group, you have those digital skills. And not necessarily all those kids who were born you know, ten years ago have digital skills and they're still completely yeah, adrift of them. Yeah. I had a conversation with Mark Prince when he was over a few years ago. I said, You missed two categories there's the digital dinosaurs and there's the digital dead as well. <laughs> <laughs> Come and visit our school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the assumptions, Why get people I made the assumption the other week that all of my year 11s will be able to use Excel and create a graph in Excel. Completely wrong assumption. They can't. So I then went and spoke to our teacher and said, What the bloody hell have you been doing for the last two years? Oh, we just have to do that for. Anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry, no, but there's also a social assumption that people who are older have no ICT skills either. So there's no stigmatised by even though they're in school. We kind of assume that they're not using ICT because they're older. Yeah, and we assume that the younger teachers coming through are all like this. Mm -hmm. I had a very experienced teacher on. say recently that she couldn't see any point in, in spending money on training people our age, as in my age, apologies to all the young people in the <laughs> <laughs> my age and older to be doing this. Why would we invest in people like me and, and her and so forth? Because we're all past it, why would we bother? We should be putting money into all the new and young teachers. Fantastic. Well, it's a great idea. <laughs> And, and she has been the leader of ICT in her primary school in the past for a number of years as well. And I just thought that was a little interesting. I don't know if that can be in other places hear, sometimes. Can I get like her email address? I'll get a pick. Okay. Um, <laughs> OECD said there's a major concern about the gap between use of technologies and learning and daily experiences, which is back to the other stuff. Um, and reveal, and on the UK 
projects, found that learners, and I make no apologies for those you people, uh, found learners need to develop a learning literacy, defined it. The ability to self manage the learning process. The capability of negotiating time over there, sorry. Learning outcomes. I think it's proved by some list, <laughs> <laughs> um, The time to review and reflect on the learning process whilst learning. Uh, finding and evaluating the use of a wide range of digital and non-digital resources and the ability to share and develop this learning literacy with others. They all sound very familiar. Shall we call them key competencies? Just worded very slightly differently. Self-thinking, communicating with others, research, etc. etc. Um, so, so this was um, the first research that was carried out. Um, and there's excerpts from these, hopefully. Just to give you a taste now, I'll put the link on the, the paper there. So. Um, so, we have a quick list of that, as you feel. Um, this isn't staged, these kids in my class, they didn't actually know I was doing it. Um, because they're not really too sure what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> I just assume if I'm wandering around, I'm just wandering. But these are my kids working on, on the course, it's from year 13. Um, as you look along, you'll actually see that the vast majority of them are on different pages, different activities. They're all working at their own pace. So um, I've got a real mix of ability. I've got some really bright kids and some less able. They don't feel threatened by the fact that they're working slightly slow because they haven't got to keep putting that up saying, but I don't understand, but I don't understand, but I don't understand. They can work at their own pace, I can just wander around and they walk past them and just, oh, there's nobody here. So you know, it's, a lot, it's a lot better for them. Um, they're all completing the work by due date. They're less able to do enough to get by and do a really good job. More able because they've got completely limitless resource, they're actually researching far deeper slot than I would have expected them to be. Um, so the differentiation, there's no, no threats involved. Just I noticed a bit of a trench in the go between them, so it's not just like they're just socially, they're socially isolated from each other and we could have been explaining that. Yeah, you're with the point here to the... Yeah, there's lots of discussion. The classroom isn't quiet, so you know, don't, don't think you're just sitting there, you know, all you can do is rattle the keys. Yeah. There's conversations going on. Most of them, I would say, are actually linked to the work. You know, how did you do that? What's it mean by that? And they'll say, well, this is it, or oh, this is what you find out. Yeah. You know, some of them are, they're so engrossed, they don't want to stop and explain too much. They say, well, I found it from here. Go and find it. So they're helping each other to find where it is. Um, so that's your classroom all the time? Yeah. So you, you've got those computers in your classroom? I've got eight computers, computers at the back of the okay. classroom. Yeah. Um, have other teachers in your school said, hey, this is great, this is working really well for Nigel, can we get this in our classroom? There's one or two starting to. Um, How's that going down? Uh, mm, not so well with some stuff. Well, not so well with management because obviously they've got to find money for more computers. Um, although we're starting to encourage more and more kids to bring their own laptops in. Um, You've got the infrastructure in place. We've got the wireless, so they can just work on it. Some staff aren't overly happy when the kids go in and say, why can't we learn like we do in geography classes? Yeah. Um, and some staff are getting a little bit tetchy at that and starting to get shitty with me, but that's fine. That's, that's their problem. They need to grow up and get with the plot. <laughs> Yeah, it's the access. The access is going to be the big thing for most people. Yeah. <coughs> I did a, a questionnaire, an online questionnaire at the end of the first unit to find out roughly what was happening. Most of the kids actually like that style of learning. Um, and they don't want to go back. 
They like the self-managed differentiation, so they can decide how hard they work. They don't feel like they know people. They can work at the pace they want to work at. They don't feel they've got to rush along to keep it with everybody else. Uh, the other thing, in one of my classes, I've got um, two Japanese exchange students and a Finnish exchange student in there as well. So if we were doing a true face-to-face -face class, those kids are lost. Because they wouldn't be able to do the language, the technical language, that the translators wouldn't work fast enough. Because they're online, they can work at their own pace, they can do their online translations, and they're still producing good work. In fact, the Finnish girl is actually producing the best work in the class. She's a bright kid, but she's just, she translates. Well, the words she doesn't understand in the, in the written space, she translates on the online translator, the Finnish understands it, comes back to my sort of English. It's just, it's weird. Um, one of the comments that did come out of it, the less able students struggled with the amount of freedom they were given. They just couldn't. Because in a lot of other classes, it's right, this is what you're going to do, you've got 10 minutes to do it, and then, you know, then they, they brush through it. But because there's nobody saying, well, you've got 10 minutes to do this, and then we're going to move to the next activity, they kind of struggle with the self management. But they've improved since I did the lecture, which was eight weeks ago. Because they're learning new skills from their mates, I'm also jolling them along a little bit more. So it seems to be working. Can I ask um, in regards to differentiation, do you, do you spouse enrichment over extension or extension over the first students that have got through whatever it is that you've, you've said in the past to get to the end of that chunk perhaps today? Um, generally, um, most of them seem to finish about the same time because um, all of them submit their work online. So they'll do their Word documents, PowerPoints, whatever else. They submit it on onto the, the marketing. I'll mark it. And if I think they could have done better than they've done, I say to them, go back to this and change it uh, to improve it. So that kind of slows them down. I did have one kid who just hurtled through the first unit at 90 mile an hour, but he was just doing cursory answers, real, bare, bare minimum, really. So he got to the end and said, what do I do now? Go back and read the comments I've put on all your pieces of work. What will happen? I said, have you acted on them? No. We'll do that. You know, I'm putting feedback on there, which is what you guys want. So actually pay attention to it. And by the time you've been back and done all that, everybody else will caught up to it. Um, and you know, because it's online, they can always research even more material. Yeah, we've seen that debate now. But if they finish that unit to a suitable standard, so we were debating about the image versus extension and how uh, yeah, that would look in a computer savvy classroom. Yeah, I mean, some of the kids initially struggled with the concept of uploading the work and then um, checking their emails to see whether I've marked it, and they just get an email saying your work's been returned. Um, and then they have to open it and check the comments. So, um, but now they're into it. You know, they just every lesson they just point a little bit their grade book to find out what they've done because they know nine times out of ten it would have been marked before the next lesson. So, so it is about them getting used to the new way of learning. Yeah. Most of them have jumped into it with both feet and <coughs> done really well. In terms of the what was the resistance like to begin with? You say that the SL is too hard um, or uh, I don't you know like to get them oh, I don't check my emails or I don't like to check my emails or, did you get it, like it, it wasn't the, um, the too hard or email, but it was for someone that was not the one of the computers, okay. which you know, goes through this digital native idea again. You know, they might have grown up in the digital age, but they're not natives. Um, but they've learned they've learned ways to get around their dislike, and um, we found some of it was they were just uncomfortable with there was. They were scared of doing something that was going to go wrong and then they'd lose all their work, which is how I was 15 years ago. If you delete it, it's going to lose everything. But we, I, I spent some time with them and said, no, you can just do what that all day life in life. <coughs> just hit the undo button and it's all going to come back for you, so don't panic. And when they've got that bit of confidence in the technology and in, in fact it's not going to disappear altogether, then actually most of them are now actually running. There's only one kid out of three classes that says, I don't like this. Fine. Do it on paper. You want to get your 
I'll pay for not do it that way. That's fine. That's okay. You don't see your kids who are working, you know, work without computers. <coughs> Presumably, there's more than eight kids in the class. They have these kids doing all sorts of things. I've, um, uh, well, if I haven't got enough sharing, and um, sometimes I'll I'll have two work on a computer, not very often, but I I normally make sure that I've got the library computer booked. Oh, okay. So you, you're in. So sure they're got they're in a different room, um, and I tend to walk between the two because it's not that far. But if, if a kid wants my help and I'm not in the library, they just flip me an email and it flashes on the screen. And so it's one-to-one, -one, basically. It's not yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the thing I've found here, because they all work at their own speed and they're all at different stages. I can just walk around and deal with the kids more individually than I could before. There's just more time to be with the kids. So your classes are using the library computers? And I got in first, so some of the rest on here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I only ship to nine tenths of the law, and if, if they're sitting there and all kids are doing is playing games in a study class on the computers, they shouldn't be in there anyway. Yeah. The logistics of, of not having enough computers is, is the, going to be the real stumbling block for most people. Can I just go back to something you said earlier with regard to? Having to the ICT teacher say, "What are these students learning?" Do you see that as a barrier as well in the ICT in the computing classes? They're not learning maybe skill sets. I, I, I ask it because I know that some of the schools I work in, they were we're talking about saying, "Is there a standard skill set that we need to ensure our students have, or that we can or upskill them at some stage so that they can take advantage?" Of these opportunities, um, and then, you know, I don't know. I just yeah, I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time talking to the, uh, the IT guy, um, and he's—I think he's trying to talk himself out of a job um, because he says I think IT um, skills should be taught within the subject areas, so within geography, within history, within social studies, by those teachers, not by a specialist IT teacher. Probably yourself out of a job somewhere. Um, I I can't see that working because I don't think enough of the probably social studies, history, whatever teachers have got the skill sets to teach kids how to do graphs in Excel. Um, yeah, we talk about digital dinosaurs or digital dead. Um, you know, how can we get some of these teachers to teach those things in their subject area if they don't understand themselves? So I think there's definitely a place for the IT uh, as a discrete subject. Um, but yeah, is there a skill set they need to take through? I think they need to cover at least the basics in any of the programs they're likely to encounter at school. Because even if they never come across a computer again after they've done their year nine or ten slot in IT, at least when they go to the workplace, they do distant memories of it. The brain, they will still think, oh yeah, I've got a graph in Excel, and I sort of do this. His argument is, do they really need to do that? Because if they don't know, they just Google it, and you can find all these help sheets that say you do this, you do this, you do this. And most of them are plenty good. So, you know, again, do they, need to, do they need to know and retain that information, or do they just need to know where to find it? And then how to use it. And it's a, that's an ongoing debate about education. When some of us were at school, you had to learn all the stuff and cram it into your brain because you didn't have the instant access to computers. Now the kids don't necessarily need to know everything. They just need to know the basics and the, the concepts and then how to tell the stuff and find them. That's one of the major tensions in teaching at the moment is this shift from you know, teacher sage content. <coughs> there's content everywhere now. We know this. So. Our job has changed and it's changing. We should facilitate learning now rather than just yeah, that means that we have content all the time. And there will be some tools within certain contexts for curriculum areas that will be more appropriate to that context than that. It's a drama for children, for each one. Absolutely. And therefore, maybe the ICT guy is probably going to well, I can't teach 150 different tools that might be, might be mm -hmm. used in different contexts. So, 
in the US school, we've done exactly that. Connor gave us a, li a list of all of the IT skill set that a year eight student should know by the end of year eight. And we get to our curriculum meeting and said, who's going to take, which department's going to take responsibility for teaching these kids the Excel? Which, which department's taking responsibility for teaching them how to use email in the school and organise their folders and things like that? And so everyone went away, and when we just recently came back to um, our curriculum meeting and said, right, can you prove that you've taught this to your students? And they had to go away, some of them, and learn how to teach it, but it upskilled their own yeah. school levels as well. So it's a, I think it's the way that IT teaching should be going. And year 11, We've taken IT away completely from year um, 9 and 10 and year 11 it's back in as a subject again, so I guess we're getting down to more specialised stuff. Mm. Have you, in the, in the secondary schools, catered for students and coming through with all of those skills or reading and extending and that? Well, that's, what, oh, that's why I think that we dissolved it in year 9 and 10 and said some of these kids are really good at this those skills so in your curricular areas you're going to be using them because they are tools after all aren't they and not actually yeah, yeah. And that's why if you say they are tools really why we actually give them the whole specific yeah. subject, subject. Yeah. I mean it's interesting to compare it to the, the, the tension over literacy and numeracy standards isn't it because that is an abstract pursuit whereas most primary design is actually it's a context for setting which uh, literacy and numeracy really grows and develops. And that's exactly the same we're describing here. Mm -hmm. We're in the context we're in a classroom, we're using the tool. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, time for yeah. another yeah. yeah. uh, The new focus on pedagogies can be by moving towards student centred education and a move away from teaching to learning. So, uh, a big difference there. And Caulfield apparently said, learning refers to only significant changes in capability, understanding, knowledge, practice, attitudes, or values by individuals, groups, and organizations as such. So that's what we're coming as learning facilitators. And I think we need to start thinking ourselves more as learning facilitators rather than teachers. Um, so shortly, you're going to, if we've got time, which hopefully we'll have, um, I'm going to try and get you to create something of a page. Um, design implications that I've come across, and some of this is through trial and error and reading stuff, looking at the wheel. Keep it simple and attractive. Okay, if you overload the page, kids are just going to say, not interested. Okay, scaffolding, the links to useful sites and images. Okay, my year 11 is quite heavily scaffolded, slightly less than year 12, so I'm looking year 13, because I feel by that stage they should have learned the relevant skills. Maybe text up with images. Um, I'm a firm believer in books now. If you're using Moodle, um, you create things in an electronic book. It just ties it all up. And instead of just having this whole wedge of information that kids have to work through, it breaks it down to more user friendly bits. Um, range of activities, software packages. Just show your normal classroom. Don't give them the same activity all the time. Break it up different things. Keeps them interested. Uh, uploading assignments um, is, is easy. Uh, I hope that's going to be I don't need to do This is just um, the, the front page of the <coughs> that I've got. You can choose different backgrounds. I just chose different ones for different levels. Um, so order, organising things into the books just means it's just more easy to navigate rather than just a whole series of topics that they yeah. to put together. Yeah. Okay? Because if the kids see yeah. a list of things like this they've got to go through, a list of assignments, yeah. of things that they go, oh, bloody hell. Yeah, I mean, Whereas, you need clients to open them up when they need them so they can't see all of that yeah. over um, like stuff. Um, so that's very quick and this. So from the front page basically just explains what's in there, what we're going to do. Um, and then each of the topics is set up. The front part of, of it is exactly the same. It's the title, how many credits they've got. Tells them tasks are in this different colour, which doesn't stand out very well on there, but it's okay. I mean, 
Uh, but they've got assignment to do. Any words that are involved, they have to complete an online glossary. So they can make entries. If they don't like the entry that's there, they can change it. Um, and I can see who's made the entry, so somebody can change it and make it completely pointless or inappropriate. So it's a communal business that everyone can subscribe to the glossary. Um, so just go in and they just put in something so nice. if, if they like it, they just leave it. If they want to change it, they just go to the edit and change it. So they, they put it in me. They put this in. Because yeah. I've been trying to get my students to do a glossary, but I haven't given it enough structure in terms of how to go about it. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way. Yeah. So for me, it works. Yeah. So, um, so when a new student write, they delete what the old student has written and write in their new definition. Mm. How does the old student feel about that? Do you think you get it? Oh, sir, that you know, that deleted my, yeah. Yeah, well sometimes I'll say, well, Mister, my definition is really good, this one's rubbish. And I'll just go on and find out who's changed it. So, so why did you put this and I think it does that? So then very often they have a whole class discussion for probably 10 minutes is that why is this definition better than this one? Oh, that's really good. And um, that gets everybody thinking, you know, it, it gets quite easy to stuff. People think it's a really good definition. It's, it is actually rubbish, but they think it's brilliant. And then they put it, argue it, and you know, their mates will jump in and say, well, hey, this is really good, Mr. Big Head. And then Smithy's put it. And this is good. This is the point. So I can ask another question, though, this, this, this is really interesting for me. Is there, do you get students who never put any definitions in at all? Yep. And um, but do they ever go in and look at the definitions? Yes, they do. Okay. So they'll want to see what other people are. On Moodle, you can actually go into the, um, the reports log yeah. Yeah. and yeah. see yeah. where yeah. they've been yeah. and what they've been up to. So, so they all go, okay, that's yeah. as fine as they're going in. Is there space on here for them to see what other students are doing? Uh, no. We um, So this is how I set the book up. So the first page is just lots of what. So you see, I do still need books. Still valuable. Textbooks are still valuable. Um, so basically, just read through a chapter. This one's just going to want to rub you bit, and then just put them on the next chapter. Um, I'm already, I uh, said it home, I said it as well yesterday. I love lots of what Moodle can do, but I'm getting really frustrated with the, the design limitations. I need to be able to do more on the design. It's, it's, it's good, but it's just that little bit limited. I, I think. Um, I, you can only sort of do wordy type of things, or you can't even do all the things you can do in Word. Yeah, I'd like to be able to have more whiz and more background colours and things like that, which you can't do at the moment. Are you doing what I do? Oh, yes. I'm worried when it just comes through because apparently half the links that you've got your resources in are all over and you have to rebuild them all. Yeah. I think you've got to be careful. They're in the process of migrating, I think, welcomers mm. through Catalyst, but yeah, we're looking at it. But just, just building on what Nigel was saying, I think that once you, I mean, I started e-learning probably 15 years ago, I guess. And, and I think, you know, you, you start with something like Moodle and, and that's kind of your landing page. So whatever you choose is fine and you can organise your stuff around there, but very quickly, I think within a year or even quicker now, you actually start to get to the stage where shit, this doesn't actually do what I want to do. So you start using Flickr and bits and pieces, but you kind of coordinate in that portal. Mm. Kind of call it a portal entrance. So it doesn't matter what it is. It can be Blackboard, it can be Ultranet, whatever. Whatever you're comfortable with, you know. But you do just quickly start to think, geez, I want to do more than this. Ask the kids too. I had a hell of a lot of good stuff from kids when I was teaching them. Mm. So why don't you use this just a rush? Yeah. Um. So all the tasks are, are highlighted, they know what the tasks are. Um, I've actually put um, a link to the assignment there so they don't have to come out to find the assignment yeah, and link normally. I just, just <coughs> so they just click on there, they browse their documents, find it, upload it, job done. That's all they have to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Qu question about is that all done in class or do they have to do some of that at home? They can do it at home, 24 7. So, how do they actually finish <coughs> what they didn't finish in class? Uh, 
And well, I mean, and obviously, I mean, if they didn't, then they could pick up where they left off when they come back. Because really, they are the like, tremendous flexibility of their own place. Yeah, good then. I've got some kids serving between 12 and 30 when it they have to work on the test in the But I've also worked with some of the resistance is our students can't access it at home. But you you were saying that if they they're, they're engaged, they actually get a lot of it done while they're at school anyway. So they don't have to do a lot of it at home. Well I've got um, I've got one kid in the show. Guess what he wants to do geography. Um, but because his timetable will clash in those subjects couldn't do it with the, with the rest of the class. So he does level two geography during the study period. He does it as a pure online course. There's no blended stuff with him at all. He uses a pure online course. The only contact I have with him is if he happens to see me in the, the corridor at a break and he's got a question, he asks me a question, or he'll do like the VC kids do, he'll email me a question. So the course works on, on two levels. It, it, it could be a true standard of course, or like I tend to do 10 to 15 minutes at the start of a new concept, not necessarily every lesson, but if it's uh, on the demographic transition model, you know, the kids have a real issue getting their head right on that. So we spend 10 to 15 minutes going through it, making sure they all have a handle on that topic. Then the show mind works through the activities. And if it takes them two lessons, three lessons, so be it. it's not an issue. So, looking down for the that you see, she actually uh, had a lot of interesting experience that her online students were achieving higher level than face to face students. And then the current kind of tertiary climate was quite, mm. quite challenging. Yeah. Does, he, does, he ask, does that student ask other kids in the forum stuff? Uh, it doesn't ask in the forum, he just asks them if he sees them or emails them sometimes as well. Okay. Yeah, so, again, it's that collaborative. Door is open, wind comes in, cup falls down. Sweet, silly summer.